What's up guys, JS2 Sense here, and gaming laptops are usually one of those love it or hate it type of categories, but you know, given the fact that computers are getting more powerful and less power draw and power demanding, it's no surprise that we are seeing a whole bunch of new laptops, especially with Coffee Lake. So we're gonna be kicking this off right here by, well, our series of gaming laptops coming up here by starting with the Digital Storm 15.6 inch Equinox gaming laptop. It's thin, it's lightweight, but more importantly, is it powerful? Well, we're gonna find out. Do you want to be cooler? Do you want to be more desirable? Well, you're in luck because right now you can own your very own Jay's Two Cents swag and immediately be the cool kid on the block. Max out your sex appeal by following the link down below. So with the launch of Coffee Lake late last year meant that we obviously had new mobile platforms coming. And this is our first one we're taking a look at here in the studio, the Equinox S8955. This is a 15.6 inch IPS 1080p gaming slash productivity laptop. What I love about this is you can see it is a very minimalist design. You have a very sleek Digital Storm logo, a matte black cover with some silver accents back here on the hinge. Nothing gaudy, no LEDs everywhere, no bright red or orange or colors to be like, hey, I'm a gamer. But on the back, you can see we've got a massive amount of cooling and ventilation because this is also a 1070 Max-Q NVIDIA discrete graphics card in here. So that means it has a very strict criteria of both acoustics and thermals that have to be maintained. If you guys have used any small form factor or thin laptops before, you know you usually sacrifice connectivity, but not the case here. You have our charger port right here, which uses our 150 watt charger brick. This is also thin and lightweight. You can carry this in a backpack. It's not gonna weigh you down. A full size HDMI 2.0, which is going to give you HDR10 capability so you can connect it to external HDRs or TVs and get that playback. Two mini display ports right here and two USB type C and then two USB 3.0. And moving to the other side, you got another USB 3.0, a headphone and microphone jack and a full size SD card reader, which is perfect because if you're using this for content creation, video editing on the go, which I will be at Computex, this is important. And of course we have our ethernet jack right here with this little fold down door. Keeps it nice and sleek and kind of out of the way when you're not using it. Once you open it up though, we are going to expose the best part of this laptop, which is the 15.6 inch 144 Hertz 1080p IPS five millisecond panel. And the fact that it's IPS makes it perfect because of color accuracy and color uh, recreation when it comes to video editing or picture editing. But the five millisecond 144 Hertz 1080p make it also a good mix for gaming. We've got our membrane keyboard right here. It is full RGB backlit, customizable backlit via software that's built into the unit. We've got our speakers right here, which are up fire in front of the monitor. Our trackpad is uh, placed off center to the left a little bit. That's fine with me. It has a fingerprint reader on there though, which shows you that they're taking security in mind. I have not personally set up the fingerprint reader, but it's here on the trackpad. And then of course we got our left click, right click buttons, which I do feel is a little bit spongy, um, but they're also not easy to bump while you're using the trackpads. Now, before we get into performance here though, I'm gonna go ahead and crack this one open because upgradability is something that's important when it comes to laptops. This particular model comes with a 500 gigabyte uh, Samsung 960 Evo NVMe SSD, which I think is a little bit lacking. So I'm gonna personally expand this to one terabyte, not today, but I'm gonna do it before Computex. And it has uh, 16 gigabytes of DDR4. That's gonna need to be upgraded to 32 gigs for me as well. But I also wanna take a look at what's going on with cooling in there. So that's what we're gonna do next. All right, so we're gonna crack this apart. I'm gonna be using my iFixit kit to do this. I know this seems like an advert, but it's not. I actually bought these. So if you guys are curious about the tools I'm using and you want these also for yourself, there will be a link into the description of an Amazon link where you can go and check them out. Every single teardown I do, pretty much I use this kit for. Actually, I think my wife got it for me for my birthday last year. So there's that good old wifey. I have not taken this apart before. So I guess if I break it, at least I already did my benchmarks. Wow. So this is actually using Corsair Vengeance DDR4 in here. Oh, check this out. We can actually put a three and a half inch or two and a half inch right here. That's perfect. So I'm not even gonna bother taking this out now. I'm actually gonna stick in an SSD right now. So you can expand this, look at this. You can do a two and a half inch drive, whether it be a hard drive or an SSD, but it does look like we only have room for two sodium uh, sticks right here. Now I didn't unhook the battery. You probably should during this. So do as I say, not as I do. This is the hole down here, just with one screw. This is such a delicate, like, 
ribbon cable. We've now expanded another 500 gigabytes. And that's it. So we just put it back together in reverse order. Make sure it's all snapped into its place. So I figured we'd start things off here with the performance test with an actual boot timer. So I just pushed the power button and we can, uh, Phil, put a little timer up on the screen in post there, would you? Because I'm bad at counting. But it's a 960 Evo NVMe SSD. So as you can see, it boots up pretty quickly. Um, yeah, not bad at all. So here's what we're gonna do. I went ahead and did a gambit of benchmarks on this. I spent about eight hours going through testing various games on this. It is a 1070 Max-Q with eight gigabytes of GDDR5. And we do have, of course, the i7-8750H, six core, 12 thread CPU. So let's see how it performs. So what you're looking at here is the Control Center 2.0. Um, this is kind of like their little, well, I guess Control Center for the laptop. I don't see myself really using this over time. Like you can see the fan profile for the GPU is on the left side, CPU temperatures and fan profile on the right side. And what I think is kind of interesting here is it's got an automatic setting, which I guess you give an offset to the fan curve, which is interesting. The maximum speed, the max Q, and then the custom. You can make your own fan curve. This appears to be a button that does nothing, whatever. Let's go ahead and start with CPU temperatures, shall we? We're using, oh uh, crap, I just closed MSI. There we go. We are using MSI Afterburner though to actually monitor the CPU temperatures because when you use the control center for the temperature reading, and then you start something like Cinebench, which loads the CPU, this stops updating. Now you guys already saw what my Cinebench score was. What we're looking for here are temperatures. So when I click run, they immediately shoot up into the 70s, upper 70s. When this becomes a little bit more heat soaked, it will reach 90, 91-ish, 86, 85, 88. So it definitely gets warm, but not too warm. I mean, laptops are designed to run warmer. They truly are. And what we saw was not a huge drop off in terms of thermal throttling. Our highest score was a 1095. This score right here was a 1064. We have been doing some gaming and stuff on here right now, so the temperatures are a bit warmer. We also have MSI Afterburner running, a few other programs running in the background. But our max temperatures, we re looks like we hit 91 on a couple cores. So I'm gonna have MSI Afterburner up because I wanna see what kind of overclocks we can actually get with this unit. I'll be using Heaven to test this, uh, only because it's a bit consistent. But because of the max Q nature of thermal and power draw and temperatures, even though we have a button available to us and a slider that we can utilize in MSI Afterburner, it does take effect. But the thing is, once the temperatures reach about 55 C, we start to see a reduction in core clock in order to keep from breaking out of that max Q setting that is basically hard controlled by NVIDIA. So let's go ahead and do a plus 100 on the core clock. We can see what happens to our core speed right here. And it jumped up into the 1600s, but watch now that we're temperature is gonna go up right here, 57C, 58C. This is starting to come back down towards the 1300s. As this hits 60, this will drop back down into the 13s periodically. And a lot of our overclock, see there's our 13s again, is being negated because this temperature is going up. But if you look at our FPS right here for heaven with high bent or high settings and tessellation is on and 2X MSAA, this FPS is actually pretty damn good in the 90s and up into the 100s. But what about an actual game? Okay, so here we are in Doom, undoubtedly one of the most fun replay value games in terms of graf graf graphatical, graphical? Graphical, yeah, graphical quality. But what I wanna point out here real quick is we do have MSI Afterburner hooked to Vulcan, which is showing 289, 290 FPS which is exactly double what the actual in-game FPS counter is showing. 
So I think we should ignore the Vulcan counter here and go with the in game. Here, we're gonna be running the highest settings possible to start because Doom does not require a crap ton of hardware to run really well. We are set to Vulcan custom because everything is on ultra with nightmare applied where applicable. So as you can see, we are currently well over 100 FPS in 1080p ultra plus nightmare in Doom. Where are you at? Oh, there we go. I mean, 100 and 200 FPS there for a second. I mean, granted, we're in the Titan's layer. I mean, it's not really rendering like a huge world, right? This guy's like, ow, 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 ow. I think a lot of people would agree that Doom has one of the best soundtracks. <laughs> the one thing that's kind of lacking on this laptop, honestly, is speaker quality. I mean, I think they did an okay job considering the size at which they have to work with, but I think a lot of gamers at the same time, and I'm not answering for all gamers, but I think most people would play with headphones anyway. Yeah, I think there's no doubt that this thing can game. And look at the GPU temperature. It still runs cooler than a Founders Edition desktop card while gaming flat on a table. All right, some final thoughts here on the Digital Storm Equinox. Um, the 15.6 inch form factor to me is the perfect sweet spot. 17 inch has always been a little bit large to try and fit in a backpack, especially if it's a thicker laptop. And then 13 inch, it's perfect size for on the go, but it can't play games. So I feel like this is the perfect sweet spot. I'm still in love with its minimalistic design. When it comes to laptops, I am a huge fan of less is more in terms of just how sleek it looks. But the level of performance that this has, the gaming capability, the CPU performance on this, on top of it, the acoustics and the temperatures on this are fantastic. Now, all of the testing that I did was just sitting on a flat surface like this, which most people would use it. If you're gonna be using it on your lap, I don't recommend doing that because you will plug up a lot of the vents on the bottom, obviously using it on a bed or something. Keep that in mind. You're gonna want this on a flat surface. It does not pull in much air from the sides. That would have been, I think, one improvement in terms of cooling is if it could have done more side inlet. The keyboard is nice to type on. The keyboard is nice to play on. Um, I didn't find myself accidentally clicking on things or moving the trackpad around with my wrist, which is often a problem with very sensitive trackpads, but this one seems to be just right in terms of sensitivity. Here's the bottom line. Good gaming laptops make good productivity laptops. The amount of GPU offloading that's taking place now in a lot of modern software in terms of business solutions means that anything with a discrete GPU is going to give you a good performance. Now I didn't do battery life testing on this because my main focus on this was going to be content creation and or gaming, which is something you're always gonna to wanna to use on plug power, AC power, because that's gonna give you the max performance. Now there's a couple of things I would have liked to have seen. I just think it would have looked sleeker if they could have gotten a more edge to edge panel in this. You can see the bottom here does have a bit of flex in there, but when you're not touching and pushing that and you're just opening and closing the lid, it's pretty rigid. In fact, one thing I wanna show here real quick They've got the actual tension in the hinge just right. And when you open it, it tilts back. You can see that hinge is just right. I hate when I go to open a lid and the whole thing flips back on me. One other thing I'm not a huge fan of is the way the matte black attracts fingerprints. The moment you consider touching it, a fingerprint pops up. You haven't even touched it yet. It's just really efficient at it. They show up before you even touch it. But guys, that has been my first look here at the new 8th gen Intel 6 core laptop CPUs. You guys tell me what you think. I think Digital Storm has done a great job at minimalistic but high performance and at a price point that I think makes sense. It's just under 2000 US dollars as tested. I would have liked to have seen larger hard drive capacity and memory capacity at that price point, but given how easy it is to actually upgrade this, I don't think that's too much of a problem. But what's more important in my opinion is yours. So guys, sound off in the comments below. Let me know what you think about this. If you've got any other laptops you think I should take a look at, then make sure to sound off down there as well, or head on over to Twitter and hit me up there at JSTSense. Again, guys, thanks for watching. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.